Hi, this is Christopher Dragon, Music Director of Your Wyoming Symphony Orchestra, and welcome to our 72nd season, Metamorphosis, From Darkness to Light. Our upcoming concert, Emergence, is a celebration of the return of Your Wyoming Symphony Orchestra from what has been a difficult year and a half. We open with a Western fanfare composed by the living American composer and conductor, Lucas Rickman. The word fanfare comes from a French word that means to blow trumpets. Fanfares have been used for centuries to announce someone or something important. Although the context may change, in general fanfares are loud, flashy, short pieces full of excitement. The Western fanfare we open our concert with is exactly just that, a vibrant opener that immediately conjures images of the Old West. Unfortunately, there isn't a recording, so you'll just have to come to the concert to experience the excitement. The next piece on our program is a work by another living American composer, Christopher Theophanidis. It also features an instrument you do not get to often see at the front of the orchestra, the bassoon. It is a double reed instrument uh, in the woodwind section of the orchestra. It serves kind of as the bass foundation, like the cellos and the double basses are for the strings. The bassoon concerto by Theophanidis, I would say, is not your usual concerto and is a bit different to the music you've heard the WSO perform. But nonetheless, I think it is a fantastic piece and it's just extremely interesting. The first movement, which has the title Alone and Inward, begins with the soloist playing an introspective cadenza. This is a free passage without the orchestra, which allows an opportunity for the soloists to be free and expressive. This opens into a fast and restless first movement that makes use of several of the ideas from the opening cadenza. As you will hear throughout the concerto, the orchestra provides a sort of atmospheric accompaniment. Here it opens with a buzzing of energy in the strings with flashes of colour from the rest of the orchestra. A little trick that Theophanidis uses is that he interchanges the melodic line of the solo bassoon with the orchestral bassoon. This is so the soloist can sneak in a breath while it continues to sound like one never-ending melodic line. Halfway through the movement breaks down, once again giving a freeness to the soloist, like what we heard in the opening cadenza. Even the orchestra sounds as if it's lost, wandering, trying to find its way back. With the help of the solos, we find our way back to the exciting rhythmic drive with the flashes of colour we heard from before. This now builds to a climax with the entire orchestra playing in rhythmic unison. As the 
title of the movement suggests, it ends alone and inward. The second movement, titled Beautiful, is based on a kind of melodic ornamentation that one would hear at a kind of Greek Orthodox church. Fast inflections of long tones that keep the notes alive in time. As you can hear, the music is quite hypnotic. Eventually, the movement brings us to an elegant lilt, which becomes obscure by the change to 5-8, meaning five beats in a bar. The feeling of it in the music is like trying to dance on an even ground. The movement closes with the soloist in conversation with the woodwinds, with the hypnotic ornamentation being passed around the different wind instruments. The third movement, titled Searing Focused, shows off the virtuosity of the bassoon. It is based on a fast pattern of sixes in the bassoon line, on top of a slow harmonic progression. This movement isn't all fast bluster. There is a moment of spaciousness where time stands still and there are droplets of rain. Interjections of the sixes are heard once again to give momentum. However, now the slower harmonic background is revealed clearer. The movement ends with one last final buildup of virtuosity for an exciting conclusion. What is even more exciting about this bassoon concerto is that it was composed specifically for the soloist that is joining us for the concert, Martin Kuskman. Martin is a multiple Grammy-nominated artist who has performed with many of the world's leading orchestras and conductors. I am so thrilled that he is able to join us for our opening concert as he really is the rock star of the bassoon. Martin and I have actually performed this concerto back in 2013 in Estonia, which is a bit of an interesting story, uh, but you'll just have to come to the concert to hear all about it. We now come to the final work on our program by Ludwig van Beethoven, a German composer and pianist that was a crucial figure in the transition between the classical and romantic period in music. Romantic composers prioritized individual and emotional expression above its form, which was a key element of the classical era. Now, they didn't completely break away from structure, but instead, used these forms as a foundation without being constrained by them. Beethoven's symphonies, in particular, shifted the train of what a symphony could be. Premiered in 1808 and celebrated during his lifetime, Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 has become the most identifiable work of, the, of classical music in the entire canon. 1808 was a terrible time for Beethoven. Impending deafness frightened him to the core, the Emperor Napoleon was marching over his homeland, and his brother had married a woman whom he called Queen of the Night. Money was short, music alone made life bearable, and through music he became a master of his destiny. That journey is reflected in the Fifth Symphony. The first movement begins with the iconic four notes, which Beethoven described as fate, 
knocking at the door. This is the seed of this symphony's greatest in innovation in that this little motive forms the subject of the entire first movement's tumultuous struggle and returns again in the third and fourth movement to cast the work's triumphant conclusion. Let's listen now to the opening of the first movement to hear how that fate motive instantly becomes the foundation being passed around the orchestra. brings us to the second theme of the movement, a contrasting lyrical section providing us with some much needed relief. If you listen carefully, however, underneath this you can still hear fate knocking at the door. It isn't long now until our fate motive returns, bringing us to the development section where these ideas are explored even further. During this section, an exchange between winds and strings give the impression that the movement is easing to once again give us some relief, but fate is never far away, bursting in with that tumultuous struggle bringing us to the recapitulation where we hear all the material from the opening once again. Beethoven, being the innovator that he was, does something very unusual in this section. He adds an oboe cadenza, meaning a free solo passage. As I mentioned earlier, romantic composers used structure and form as a foundation, but did break away from it for individual expression, which is exactly what this oboe cadenza is for. The second movement is constructed as a set of variations on not one, but two themes. The first theme is sweet and melodic, heard in the violas and cellos. It has a dotted rhythm giving the melody a sense of easiness, as if you're having a walk while humming a tune. The second theme, heard in the clarinets and bassoons, is more assertive, becoming grand and noble when the oboes and brass continue it. For this talk, we are going to focus on that first theme and how it is varied. The first and second variation continues with the melody in the violas and cello. However, the first variation changes the rhythm to constant sixteenth notes, giving the melody a gentle flow. And the second variation changes the rhythm to 32nd notes, making it sound even quicker, resulting in even more momentum. Here is that second variation.
This idea is explored further as it's passed to all the different instruments in the orchestra. After all this momentum, things eventually come to a stop and we are left with what I perceive as a heartbeat, with the fragment of our first theme being ex explored on top of it, this time by the woodwinds. There is a sense of freedom as the woodwinds dovetail back and forth with this fragment. After a bitsy minor variation heard in the winds, a build-up brings us to the grand statement of our first theme, in dialogue between the violins and woodwinds. Towards the end of the movement, we have an unexpected tempo change, which is the speed of the music, bringing us to a new character and mood, turning our theme into something quite cheerful and almost humorous. This movement showcases Beethoven's skill in building on themes and proves that he can command the listener's attention with lyricism, just as he can with turmoil and bluster. The third movement brings us to a scherzo which opens with a soft melody in the low strings that sounds ghostly and ominous. It's as if something is lurking in the darkness. It doesn't take long, however, for it to burst open and we hear the horns declare a theme based on the rhythm of the fate motif. Short, 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 long. The central section of this movement, to me, has a folk character, as the music kind of digs in and gets a little bit down in the dirt. It begins as a rumbling in the cellos and basses, which is passed throughout the string section, creating a kind of round dance. The music meanders its way back to the haunting opening material, which has more of a tiptoeing character due to the short articulation and sparseness. Now, usually there is a break between the third and fourth movement. However, Beethoven links these together through an extraordinary transition. A dramatic soft section underscored by muttering timpani changes the atmosphere before an extended buildup transforms our theme, fragment by fragment, until the music erupts into a radiant C major finale. As the cherry on top, Beethoven adds trombones and piccolo to this movement, which play for the first time in the entire symphony, creating a thicker, richer texture of colours. Now, although the tiptoeing material of the third movement reappears briefly, 
This finale is just full of joy, excitement and triumph. There is not really much more to say, just to really sit back and enjoy the ride. Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 is so much more than just the famous opening four notes. It is a journey that takes us from the tumultuous first movement in C minor to the bright, radiant and triumphant finale in C major, creating a journey from darkness to light, which is why we thought it would be the perfect way to open this season. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you at our concert.